Thank you for coming. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. So on behalf of my colleagues, welcome to the first of another year of our lecture series. Glad to have you here. You can uh, pick up our printed schedule if you haven't already on the way out uh, or check it out on our website. If you signed up, you'll start getting email announcements from us. Uh, if you'd like to, just give me your email at some point. You can also, of course, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and social media. I want to thank our colleagues in Greenspun College who both make this facility available to us. And as you can see, our recording our lecture. It'll be up on our website probably next week. You can uh, also, uh, they get broadcast on public television. So if you're watching our lecture at whatever date or time this might be through that mechanism, we welcome you as well. Thrilled to have our colleague Jonathan Rauch out from Brookings. We bring our colleagues out from Washington DC throughout the academic year. If you're UNLV students, you may have had or will have Jonathan in one of your classes this week. Uh, they also meet with faculty and uh, the community, depending on their areas of research. We try and have timely lectures, although we schedule these in advance. But uh, as I like to say for almost every lecture, I think we managed to accomplish that tonight. Uh, I will leave that up to you to decide as you hear from Jonathan. Jonathan is the author of a number of books and articles on public policy, culture, and government. He's a contributing editor to The Atlantic. And among his many publications that I can recommend to you is uh, his recent ebook, Political Realism, How Hacks, Machines, Big Money, and Backroom Deals Can Strengthen American Democracy. So uh, uh, think about that as he's speaking tonight as well. Uh, Jonathan is, is making his first visit to us at Brookings Mountain West in UNLV. He's not a stranger to this part of the country, having been born and raised in Phoenix. So we welcome him to the north here. Uh, uh, I, he's getting a full immersion in contemporary Las Vegas this week. So I, I'm happy to turn the podium over to John. Thank you, Bill. Thank you to Rob Lang, uh, Caitlin Saladino, the Brookings Mountain West Center, uh, UNLV. It is such a privilege to be here with you. It's like being home for me, as, as Bill just said. I grew up in Phoenix and wonder why I ever left the West. Um, I usually give most of my talks um, without notes, but I decided to do something a little different today because I'd like to write a book about alt-truth and its implications. And I thought I'd try to spell out those ideas in a coherent way um, and try to lay them before you. So you all are kindly being the guinea pigs for what I hope will become um, a body of work, building on a book I wrote 24 years ago called Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought. Um, I titled the talk, Alt-Truth, Can Reality Survive the Era of Trump? But I want to start by emphasizing the word era. This is not a talk about Donald Trump specifically. But times being what they are, he's as good a place as any to begin. Uh, back in March, the US Labor Department released the first monthly employment report of the Trump administration. The economy had added 235,000 new jobs in February, which brought the unemployment rate down to 4.7%. This, of course, was news that any administration would have celebrated, but the Trump administration celebrated it in a rather peculiar way. In the Obama years, um, Mr. Trump had been fond of describing the monthly jobs reports as phony or totally fiction. But now, quote, I talked to the president prior to this, and he said to quote him very clearly, said Press Secretary Sean Spicer. They may have been phony in the past, but they are very real now. Now, if this was not the most outrageous thing that Trump and his minions have said, it was nonetheless a striking example of the nature and use of all truth. You have your truth, I have my truth. The same thing that was false yesterday is true today. Terms like real and fake are just epithets, like good and bad, to be bestowed 
as a matter of preference or expediency, and you don't like it? Well, you didn't win the election, did you? Um, it was also, of course, hardly the only example of all truth. We probably all recall Kellyanne Conway's defense of Trump's outlandish claims about the size of his inauguration crowd. The administration, she said, gave, quote, alternative facts. Or recall Newt Gingrich's defense of Trump's entirely inaccurate claim that the nation faces a crime wave. When an interviewer pointed out that Trump's claim was belied by statistics from the FBI, which is not a liberal organization, Trump replied, uh, sorry, Gingrich replied, no, but what I said is equally true. People feel it. As a political candidate, I'll go with how people feel, and I'll let you go with the theoreticians. Well, in politics and in diplomacy, exaggeration, spin, euphemism, sometimes outright lies, are tools of the trade, deployable for good as well as for ill. When caught in an outright lie, however, conventional politicians do not typically make the claim that truth is what they want it to be at the present moment. We must not imagine this claim to be thoughtless improvisation. As Senator Marco Rubio might say, Donald Trump knows exactly what he's doing. Think back to 2004, long before Trump's political career began. In a revealing television interview with Chris Matthews on MSNBC, he marveled at the success Republicans had had attacking the wartime heroism of Senator John Kerry. And I quote, it's almost coming out that Bush is a war hero and Kerry isn't, Trump said admiringly. I think that could be the greatest spin I've ever seen. Matthews then asked about Vice President Cheney's insinuations that Kerry's election would lead to a devastating attack against the United States. Well, replied Trump, it's a terrible statement unless he gets away with it. A terrible statement unless he gets away with it. Trump here shows himself to be an attentive student of disinformation, whose operative principle is reality is what you can get away with. What are Trump and his surrogates and allies doing? Most of us sense it is something troubling, something perhaps dangerous, something outside the pale. In this talk, I want to try to provide a framework for thinking about all truth and its implications, and I want to explain how American universities can and urgently should be part of the solution instead of being, as is too often the case, unwitting allies of Trump's troll army. Let's begin, as they say in The Sound of Music, at the very beginning. All truth is an attack on reality. But what is reality? In everyday vernacular, reality often refers to the world out there, things as they really are, independent of human perception and error. Reality also commonly refers to those things which we feel very certain about, or things which we think are extremely difficult to change. Of course, humans have no direct access to an objective world independent of our minds and senses, and subjective certainty is no guarantee of all at, at, at all of truth. In their quest for a workable concept of reality, Philosophers have wrestled with those problems for years. The story goes that the English philosopher G.E. Moore once announced in a lecture that he would prove the existence of an external reality, as the audience waited with bated breath, as no doubt you all are right now. <laughs> Moore ceremoniously produced an envelope from his coat pocket and did this. You have to admit it was hard to argue with, <laughs> which was Moore's point. In fact, we now have a pretty good idea of what objective reality is. It's a set of propositions, propositions which have been validated in some way and thereby shown to be at least conditionally true, true until debunked. Some of those statements such as, here is an envelope, resemble the world as we perceive it. Many, like quantum physics and abstract mathematics, look nothing at all like the world of everyday experience. Um, now, my locution propositions which have been validated in some way hides a cheat. In what way? Many Americans believe Elvis Presley is alive. Should we send him a social security check? Um, many believe they're aliens trying to reach planet Earth. Should we build a landing pad for them? 
Um, who decides? Many people believe vaccines cause autism. Should we stop vaccinating? Many believe Barack Obama who was born in Africa. Is he qualified to be president? Who decides? This problem is the problem of social epistemology, which concerns itself with how societies come to some kind of common understanding about truth. It's a fundamental problem for every society and attempts to resolve it go back at least to Plato who said the answer was that a philosopher king, presumably someone very much like himself, should rule over truth. Traditional tribal communities frequently use oracles to settle questions about reality, questions like, is it going to rain this week? Religious communities use holy texts as interpreted by priests. Totalitarian states put the government in charge of truth. There are many other ways to settle questions about reality. They have something in common. Most of them are terrible because most of them lead either to authoritarianism and repression or to social schisms and creed wars or both. As the great American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce said in 1877, when complete agreement could not otherwise be reached, a general massacre of all who have not thought in a certain way has proved a very effective means of settling opinion in a country. As Peirce implied, one way to avoid a massacre would be to attain unanimity, at least on certain core issues. No wonder we hanker for social consensus about realities, something you often hear today is that as Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska recently said in a television interview, uh, I quote here, we have a risk of getting to a place where we don't have shared public facts. The Republic will not work if we don't have shared facts. That's not the right answer either though. Disagreement about core issues and even key facts is inherent in human nature and endemic in a free society. Millions of Americans can and do, like the white queen, and through the looking glass believe six impossible things before breakfast. If complete unanimity on core propositions is not always possible or not always even desirable, what is necessary to have a functioning social version of reality? The answer, we need an elite consensus and hopefully something also approaching a public consensus on not the propositions themselves, but the method of validating the propositions we needn't and can't all believe that the same things are true, but a critical mass of our political and intellectual classes needs to agree on what it is we do that distinguishes truth from falsehood. With all that in mind, now I want to speak of the single greatest invention in the history of humanity. And I include fire, the wheel, capitalism, democracy, and sliced bread, namely liberal science. Liberal science is my term for a method of validating propositions that dates from the time of the Enlightenment. I could write a book about it, and indeed have. Um, but here is the bumper sticker summary. Liberal science turns over validation to a decentralized community of critical testers who hunt for each other's errors and who agree to a few rules. One rule is that any hypothesis can be floated. That's free speech. You say what you want. But another rule, is that a proposition gets to join reality only insofar as it withstands vigorous, disinterested checking that yields results which anyone could in principle replicate. So, speech is almost entirely unconstrained, but knowledge is rigorously restricted. Liberal science is a process, but it's also an ethic, a community norm. The ethic of depersonalized checking extends not just to lab sciences, but to the humanities and even journalism. My craft, as the late David Broder, the dean of the Washington Press Corps used to say, if your mother says she loves you, check it. The propositions which check out on any given day are reality, unless and until debunked. The commitment to the discipline of checking is, so to speak, the constitution of reality, the rules by which we build reality. And collectively, the people committed to the constitution of reality are the reality-based community. On any given day, of course, we won't all agree on what has or has not checked out. The speed of light is solidly agreed to, but many propositions are disputed. And in some cases, as in man-made climate change, there's even a dispute about whether the proposition is disputed. 
Liberal science constantly argues about itself, and the genius of liberal science is that it gives the global community of critics and testers and arguers time and space to work through their disagreements without authoritarian oversight. The results have been spectacular in three ways. First, liberal science harnesses millions of minds, including all of yours, to create knowledge at a staggering rate, certainly every year and probably every day and possibly even every hour, liberal science today adds more to the canon of human knowledge than was accumulated in the 200,000s of human, excuse me, 200,000 years of human history prior to Newton's day. Second, liberal science has effectively put an end to creed wars. Fighting over disagreements has been, as Peirce pointed out, humanity's default procedure for settling differences of opinions, and still is, in much of the world. Think of the ongoing creed war between Sunni and Shia Muslims. Yet in the liberal West, creed wars are his histori uh, histori pardon me, historical footnote. To become knowledge, a proposition must gain acceptance in the reality-based community, which forces members of that community to rely on persuasion, rather than force to settle their differences. Though often called a marketplace of ideas, liberal science is better described, when you think about it, as a marketplace of persuasion. Third, by definition, liberal science disempowers anyone who claims privileged or sole authority over truth. Reality, it says, is too important to be entrusted to anyone in particular, any political leader, any faction or interest group, any priesthood, or even any majority. By leaving reality under the control of no one in particular, it creates what Karl Popper called the open society, a society that is inherently founded on intellectual pluralism and freedom of thought. Together, those innovations have done nothing less than transform Homo sapiens as a species. Are we in danger of transforming ourselves back? Probably not. But we can forget how we got here and backtrack in costly ways. In fact, liberal science has always had many enemies. Many challenges arise from left, right, and sometimes center. I discuss some of them in my book, Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought. Did I mention my book? <laughs> Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought, available on Amazon for only $12. But today, I want to talk about an old bug which has suddenly become a super virus, disinformation. There is nothing remotely new about disinformation. Its distinctive feature is that unlike propaganda, which tries to make you believe something, disinformation tries to make you disbelieve everything. It scatters so much plausible sounding rubbish out there and casts so many aspersions on plausible seeming information sources that people throw up their hands and say they're all a pack of liars. The new viral version of disinformation is what we might call troll epistemology, or trolling for short. You attack real news, you attack the sources of real news, you disseminate fake news, even creating millions of fake people to disseminate it. You unleash a tidal wave of disinformation and then you mock or smear anyone who complains about it. You even troll the idea of fake news, turning it right around against itself. Propaganda, at least, typically has some relationship to truth. It must deny truth or embellish truth in order to substitute something else. Troll epistemology needn't bother with that. It's anarchism. The only rule is ridicule. Trolling has problems and weaknesses. It's antisocial, um, even sociopathic. Therefore, uh, it's very difficult to organize and direct trolling in a sustainable way. It's also parasitic. It's incapable of establishing that anything is true or that anyone is right. All it can do is demolish trust and demolish knowledge. Well, why would someone want to do that? Some trolls get lulls, laughs, from offending people, what trolls call triggering. And some of them love the thrill of intellectual vandalism. But there are other less nihilistic reasons. By demolishing trust, Disinformation sows discord, disqualifies intellectual gatekeepers, and thereby levels the playing field for propaganda and political tribalism. It's like taking down an adversary's air defenses before invading her country. So now arises an interesting question. If trolling is sociopathic 
and disinformation is parasitic, and neither of them is entirely new, how did this ancient but usually containable bug become a super virus? George Orwell, how many of you have read 1984, still relevant? You may recall this, George Orwell believed that making us doubt the truth that's in front of our nose required mighty government ministries marshalling vast resources, propaganda bureaucracies and police agencies capable of micromanaging reality and enforcing conformity in the minutest details of our daily lives. In his age, an age of big business and big unions and big government and big establishments and big everything, it was hard to see how disinformation and propaganda could succeed without large-scale institutional support, if then. Even a mighty totalitarian state like the Soviet Union struggled to contain and control reality. Dissident voices and dissident channels kept popping up. Liberal science's diffused de decentralized model thrives on dissent whereas a single Andrei Sakharov threatened the entire Soviet system. To be sure, fake news existed and entrepreneurs found ways to profit from it. Who can forget the weekly world news? As I'm sure you all recall, raise your hand if you remember the weekly world news. Does anyone here? A few of us, yay. Raise your hand if you're under 40 and remember the weekly world news. <laughs> Let me tell you about the weekly world news from 1979 to 2007. It was a tabloid. It treated us to headlines like Clinton hires three-breasted intern. Hillary Clinton adopts alien baby and bat child found in cave. In 1992, we knew George H.W. Bush was in bad political trouble when the WWN's beloved space alien endorsed Bill Clinton for president. <laughs> But even that renowned publication had to employ a staff of writers and editors to make up fake news, artists to doctor photos, and salespeople to round up ads for penile enhancement. Then it had to pay for printing, and it had to buy rack space in supermarkets, and so on. Bat Boy was expensive to create and distribute, and the market for him was small and costly to reach. By contrast, the Associated Press could aggregate and distribute reporting from reputable news organizations all around the world. Economies of scale heavily favored real news. I confess that liberal science defenders like me became complacent about propaganda and especially disinformation. There just didn't seem to be a private sector business model for it. And the state actors were weakening. We turned aside and focused on other priorities, such as campus political correctness and postmodernism and other things. What we could not then foresee was a perfect storm of technological, economic, and political changes, all working to the disadvantage of the reality-based community. First, social media created a distribution platform for disinformation. Soon after springing into existence, social media proved to be an excellent environment for the viral spread of misinformation. Putting stuff out there costs effectively nothing. No supermarket racks required. Mobilizing troll armies, hordes of humans and bots that disseminate crackery, quackery, mockery, and bullying also became easy and cheap. As Frederick, Frederick Filou writes, for a few hundred bucks, Anyone can buy thousands of social media accounts that are old enough to be credible or millions of email addresses. Also, by using Mechanical Turk or similar cheap crowdsourcing services widely available on the open web, anyone can hire legions of writers, in quotes, who will help to propagate any message or ideology on a massive scale. Second, software learned to hack our brains. Sophisticated algorithms make disinformation not only cheap but effective, allowing headlines and images to be tuned in real time to exploit cognitive vulnerabilities in our minds. These are powerful new tools that humans are ill-equipped to encounter or resist. Next up, according to Falou, weaponized artificial intelligence propaganda, which allows micro-targeting of fake or hyper-partisan news that is customized for particular individuals and distributed by a swarm of bots. Do you feel ready? Third, the clickbait economy created a business model. Disinformation went from merely vandalistic and parasitic to profitable. Google ads and Facebook monetize page views, thereby monetizing anything that generates clicks, thereby making fake and hyper-partisan content profitable. Fourth, 
Mainstream media lost credibility and profitability. The rise of the conservative counter-establishment and its 24-7 attack on lamestream media battered the prestige of traditional information gatekeepers. And at the same time, mainstream media's inability to replace print or airwave ad dollars with online ad dollars crippled the revenue model. Because accurate repertorial journalism is orders of magnitude more expensive to produce than disinformation, legitimate media's business model advantage vaporized and in fact flipped right over. Together, those changes democratized and economized disinformation. One more step was then required to complete the process. Politicians and nation states weaponized trolling. Russians, as we all now know, and as most of us who are not president acknowledge, <laughs> was ahead of the curve in understanding how to mechanize and merchandise online propaganda and disinformation. And Orwell wasn't wrong. Even today, the support of a nation state and its bureaucracy and resources add immense firepower beyond what mere individuals can do. State actors, moreover, worked in concert with Trump's so-called troll army. His supporters quickly saw the value of mobilizing social media to troll Hillary Clinton, spread nonsense, and create chaos and confusion in politics. Massive lulls. Human trolls and then Russian bots cued each other with fake news, creating an echo chamber effect that proved deafening and disorienting. Last but not least was the effect of one other actor, Donald Trump himself. A keen student of disinformation, as we've seen from his interview in 2004, and a man who had publicly and proudly designated himself a troll, he had launched his political celebrity with a lie about President Obama's birth and never stopped lying. The outrage and bewilderment evoked by his tsunami of balderdash dominated the campaign and afforded him unprecedented free media. Set aside his political views. Even his supporters should be alarmed by Trump's systematic demolition of reality. So that's how troll epistemology went from nowhere to everywhere practically overnight. Can we get a handle on it? If so, how? And what are the implications if we cannot? To sort through those difficult questions, begin with what troll epistemology is not, an attack on free speech. Censorship and authoritarian control of thought and inquiry are the more traditional enemies of liberal science and one that Americans have become pretty proficient at repelling, partly thanks to the legal force of the First Amendment. Troll epistemology, by contrast, takes aim at the constitution of reality, which has no standing in law and which no court can enforce. Think of liberal science as a funnel. At the wide end, countless millions of people including most of you in this room, float countless millions of hypotheses every day. Only an infinitesimal fraction of those will be both new and true. To find them, we run the hypotheses through a massively socially distributed error finding process. Only a tiny few make it to the narrow end of the funnel. They're a kind of social valve, call it prestige and recognition admits the surviving propositions into the canon of knowledge. People who successfully bring a proposition into the canon are greeted with publication, professorships, Pulitzer Prize, and acclaim. Censorship is an attack on the wide end of the input funnel. It tries to regulate and restrict the hypotheses that can be tested. All truth, by contrast, is an attack on the narrow output end of the funnel. It tries to disrupt, disorganize, and discredit the process of social testing. That was what Newt Gingrich was doing in the example I cited earlier. You don't like the facts as, validate, as validated by the theoreticians at the FBI? Then go with your feelings. They're just as valid. Bypass the funnel. That was what Kellyanne Conway was doing. You don't like what photos show about numbers attending the inauguration? Then we have alternative facts. Bypass the funnel. And that was what Sean Spicer was doing in the example I began with. In December, when the labor market's statisticians report declining unemployment under Obama, they are liars. In February, when they report declining unemployment under Trump, they are reliable. In other words, 
Forget about any disinterested fact checking or any consistent method of validation. Objective reality is whatever I say it is at the present moment and its guardians are whomever I designate right now. There is no one out there you can trust, so you might as well trust me. Only I can fix it. And even if you don't trust me, and even if I can't fix it, I can still keep you confused. So at least you won't believe the other guy. Now, attacks on the narrow selective end of the funnel are like censorship, nothing new. Liberal science makes a very strong claim, a claim of exclusivity in social decision making about what is and is not reality. Of course, it's a free country and anyone can say she has knowledge. Elvis is alive, fine. But the community of liberal science is defined by a social pact. In return for the extraordinary goods that liberal science brings, we will mostly ignore alternative claims on reality where social decision making is concerned. In other words, we let all truth talk as much as it wants to, but we don't let it write textbooks, grant tenure, circumvent peer review, set the research agenda, dominate the front pages, or dictate the flow of public funds. That's why we don't mail Elvis a social security check or send police investigators looking for him no matter how many people think he's alive. Notice the delicate balance here. To protect the wide end of the funnel, we disallow censorship. We say all truth is never criminalized. At the same time, to protect the narrow end of the funnel, we regulate influence. We say all truth is generally ignored. You can think whatever you want, but if your beliefs don't check out, you can't expect anyone else to care what you think, publish what you think, or even notice what you think. This strategy, which I call marginalization, is subtle, and it involves a lot of implicit social cooperation. It, it requires high degrees of both toleration and discipline. Um, it asks people to accept the social hegemony of liberal science in exchange for unmatched personal freedom. In other words, it says anyone can believe anything, say anything, unprecedented freedom. But in exchange for that, we ask special status for liberal science and its way of validating truth. With that in mind, the implications of troll epistemology come into sharper focus. By insisting that all the fact checkers and hypothesis testers out there are phonies or that you can't tell the difference between the ones who are real and the ones who are phony, it discredits the possibility of a socially validated reality and it opens the door to tribal knowledge, personal knowledge, politicized knowledge, or just wholesale confusion. By spreading lies and disinformation on an industrial scale, it shows confusion about what might or might not be true and about who can be relied on to discern the difference and indeed whether there really is any difference between what's true and what's not true. By being as obnoxious, provocative, bullying and generally antisocial as possible, it exploits shock and outrage to seize attention and dominate the conversation. That last tactic is especially clever, especially devastating and especially difficult to counteract. Liberal science is not a formal institution. It's a community of people who accept a set of norms. That truth exists. Efforts to find it should be impersonal. Credentials matter. What hasn't been tested can't be knowledge, and so on. Trolls violate all those norms. Mocking truths, launching personal attacks, trashing credentials, ridiculing testing, and, and all the rest. Epistemic liberals' natural instinct is to defend our values, but when we do, we feed the trolls, providing attention and airtime, which the trolls then use to redouble their attacks on us. Thus did Trump and his trolls delightedly seize on and repurpose the charge that they were purveying fake news. Instead of always rising to the bait, liberal science would be better served if it mostly ignored the trolls and rolled magisterially on, as it has so effectively done for decades with challenges from creationists and Lysenkoists and Christian scientists and astrologists and paranormalists and many other purveyors of all truth. But the whole problem is that marginalizing trolls is difficult. Troll epistemology has forced its way into the conversation and has at its disposal an armory of new weapons and advocates, including the President of the United States. There is just no way to marginalize a US president. Almost by definition, he can set the agenda. He can dominate the news cycle. 
He can turn the White House press secretary into a mouthpiece for baloney. He can rejigger government uh, websites to distort or suppress scientific or statistical information. He can impanel a public commission to investigate an objectively bogus theory that millions of illegal vo voters uh, deprived him of a majority, all of which and more he is doing. Thus have trolls succeeded in neutralizing marginalization, the social valve at the end, the narrow end of the funnel. Where they attack, trolls often succeed in commanding attention, dominating the agenda. And because liberal science's method is to direct the intellectual agenda toward verifiable facts and adjudicable disputes and away from politicized claims and sham arguments, trolls' agenda-setting power is itself a victory over the reality-based community. Trolls like to regard themselves as you know, merry pranksters enjoying lulls at the expense of snobs who have sticks up their derrieres. The people who brought you Pizzagate may think they're throwing a little well-deserved sand in the eyes of sanctimonious liberal media, but to paraphrase Donald Trump in 2004, it's a terrible thing if they get away with it. All truth is no joke. It is an attack on the very concept of objective reality, and therefore on society's ability to settle differences of opinion fruitfully and nonviolently. Will trolls and tweets and Trumpism triumph? I suspect not. The community and norms of liberal science have survived many challenges. Troll epistemology and its weapons have enjoyed the advantage of surprise, but with time, ways will be found to organize against them and neutralize some of their strengths. Facebook is developing methods to harness its community to flag fake news. Twitter is under pressure to weed out bots. Google is considering its truth neutral ad policies. The information seeking public seems to be developing antibodies. Many news consumers are fleeing toward quality, including to Trump's bet noir, CNN, which just reported its most watched second quarter in history. For their part, news organizations are learning how to identify and cover disinformation. Abroad, especially in Europe, media organizations, schools, and even government agencies are developing programs to teach individuals how to recognize disinformation. But someone very important is AWOL, absent without leave. That someone is the American University. Building reality is, and always has been, and always will be primarily an elite occupation. Whether you're doing bench chemistry or daily journalism, testing hypotheses requires time, money, skill, knowledge, sophistication, training, and complex social interaction. Of course, ordinary people can and should participate, and liberal science is unique in the extent to which they can. It has no priesthood or ministry of truth. The annals of science are replete with discoveries that ordinary people made. But liberal science of its very nature relies on professionalism. The distinguishing characteristics of mainstream journalism is professional editing. The distinguishing characteristic of academic research is professional review by peers and referees. Liberal science's venues are the lab, the journal, and the newsroom, its units of exchange are the book, the article, the reasoned argument. To be a really good scientist or journalist requires years of training and acculturation. And all of that is before accounting for the importance of specialization, skill, insight, and occasionally genius. If we're perfectly honest with ourselves, we acknowledge that where advancing truth is concerned, a single Einstein or Darwin or Keynes or Orwell contributes more than millions of the rest of us. It may not matter much if most of the public believes weird and wrong things. Again, one of liberal science's unique strengths is that it does not need or want to police everyday opinion. It prizes and protects diversity of belief, but it also must be able to designate certain beliefs as knowledge and then its designation must receive a presumption of deference, a rebuttable presumption to be sure, but a substantial presumption. As trolls understand very well, if the public comes to see professional academics and journalists as merely peddling their own biased opinions, the presumption of deference will wobble 
and potentially fall, and of course, that's what's happened. Obviously, this is not entirely trolls doing. To the contrary, trolls exploited long-standing flaws. One of those was mainstream journalism tendency to be colored blue, left of center, which is something we journalists need to answer for and fix. Many of us now perceive this problem, and at places like the Washington Post struggle conscientiously with it. We still have much work to do. Still, I would venture that journalism's problems with left-leaning conformism pale in comparison with those of the American university community. That the academy overwhelmingly leans left is well documented. You need to go about with a lantern in broad daylight, Diogenes style, to find a conservative in a humanities department. Even worse, many academics and students who do lean right are closeted. The university does not reliably feel like a safe space for them. Any unguarded statement, even if not obviously controversial, say a suggestion that grown-up students at Yale should not need university guidance about their Halloween costumes, could ignite a firestorm. I've had otherwise outspoken students tell me that they just won't talk at all about race or gender. It's just too risky. Perhaps worst of all, the intolerance and extremism of a campus minority diminish the public's respect for the integrity of the campus majority. The vast majority who remain committed to intellectual pluralism, who are there to study and learn rather than wage political combat, and who are doing gold standard research. As stories emerge one after another about left-wing intolerance and unreason on campus, they echo through the media to portray the university as the exact opposite of what liberal science is supposed to be. And as a result, much of the public has form the impression that elite academia is not on the level. The Heterodox Academy Project, raise your hand if you've heard about this. No one yet? A couple people. There's a website. I urge you to check it out. The Heterodox Academy dot org or com. Led by the psychologist Jonathan Haidt is trying to awaken universities to the threat which conformism poses to academia's reputation and competence. To the important arguments that Haidt and his colleagues make for intellectual diversity in academia, I would add that the cultural legitimacy of liberal science depends very heavily on the cultural legitimacy of the university. Universities are the pylons, the anchors of liberal science. They are its defining and essential institutions. They train students and scholars in the methods and mores of liberal science. They build and safeguard objective reality. Frankly, if universities are rackets, merely imposing some opinions on everyone else or pursuing someone else's political agenda, then liberal science is a racket too. If universities foster cultures of conformity rather than criticism, then the trolls are right. It's all just disinformation. It's all, all truth. So here is a warning. Social justice warriors who endanger intellectual freedom on campus are de facto accomplices and amplifiers of social media trolls who engender intellectual anarchy in politics. By giving trolls an irresistibly sanctimonious target and even more by validating populist prejudices against politicized intellectuals, the Orthodox Academy supplies trolls with the rope they need to hang it. I don't know if it's possible for elite universities to welcome conservative scholars and encourage conservative scholarship, to react civilly or mildly to controversial right of center speakers, to reject censorship in all its forms, and to define safety as something other than intellectual conformity. I don't know if campus activists and pressure groups can be disabused of the idea that constraining debate somehow serves social justice. I do know that if universities cannot find their way to genuine intellectual pluralism, the defense of reality will be vastly more difficult and the work of trolls much easier. Thank you. So we have time for discussion, and discussion is uh, what I'd like to encourage. Um, 
This is a new strand of thinking for me. I will learn more from you than you do from me. Um, and I, I guess I'm choosing my own. Any, any takers? Why don't first on the aisle and then further back? I'm wondering, the idea of having conservative academics is not necessarily a contradiction in terms for someone as old as I am. But for most people who are used to the Republican Party embracing the alt-right, isn't it difficult to have someone who would adhere to the academic standards of intellectual debate while having a right-wing view? They are conflated with the alt-right and with the, uh, the liars, if you like. So would uh, you care to comment? Um, some of you know more about this than I do, but I think most conservatives, especially most conservative intellectuals today, are still serious people, especially the ones who would be candidates for PhD programs and tenure and the like, and that the problem has much less to do with the rise of the alt-right. Most of those people, by the way, as Steve Bannon himself has said, are clowns. You know, they're 20-somethings who sit on the sofa and can't get jobs in many cases, and they show up in Charlotte to make trouble. Um, I think more of the problem has to do with the failure to create an environment that makes those people feel safe and comfortable in pursuing academic careers, and then once they get there, feeling safe and comfortable pursuing their ideas, and that's something which I suspect the rest of us can do something about, actually. We talk about safe spaces um, for all campus minorities, and we ought to make more of an effort to include and welcome and foster conservatives, especially in humanities departments, and I think certainly more could be done. Did you have something? Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, you know, welcome to UNLV. Thank you for Thank taking you. the time to come out. It's time um, to go home. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have a jam out here. So my question is... Are, are you a student or a faculty? Uh, I should ask people who they are, actually. Are you... I'm a part-time instructor. In? Uh, sociology. Very good. So you... you I'm, I'm a retired city planner. So that, that explains why you raised your hand on some of the obscure questions. Very good. <laughs> and you're... A uh, student. Understand. So uh, I'm, to be honest, I'm kind of just lost in like the whole political thing. Like I, like you said, fake news, like I don't know like kind of what to believe and all that due to, I guess, the trolls and all that. My question is like, it's, what, what do you think of, uh, one of my friends turned me on to a speaker that, you know, isn't really a fond of Trump either. What do you think of like Ben Shapiro? I haven't read his stuff. Um, I know he's conservative, I know he's smart. Um, I can't tell you to the extent to which he's a member of the reality-based community. Um, so I don't really know enough about him. I know he does campus speaking, and, and there's some trouble because a speech of his was canceled by a university. Why do you, is he someone, what, why Ben Shapiro? What's interesting about him or, in, or intriguing about him to you? Uh, well, you know, as I sat down and listened here, you know, I agreed with like a lot of what you said. Um, and, you know, he's just, kind of been like my go-to person lately. Just so you know, during work, I'll throw on some headphones and just listen. And you know, he says like some of the same things you're saying. Um, so I was, I was just curious, just because I'm, so, ju I'm just looking for an outlook, like a, you know, a, a way to get, a source to get news um, without all the, you know. Yeah, so I'm obviously people are gonna disagree on what outlets to listen to and conservatives will have a very different take on this than liberals. My own rules of thumb of course, you've got to make individual determinations for yourself. But my rules of thumb are edited journals um, that have professional staffs, reported publications that actually hire professionals to go out and look at stuff rather than recycling other news. And to me, a very important standard is will they run a correction if they're wrong? So I came up in the newspaper business and then switched to magazines. And <laughs> Sacred Writ was if you're wrong, uh, you owe your readers a correction because truth is out there and you fail. And we tried not to make mistakes because we knew we'd have to correct them. Um, if a place never bothers to correct anything but then just moves on to the next whatever, uh, to me that's usually a good tip off that it's on the level. You remember, you noticed that Trump was troll, uh, I was trolling, that's true, but crowing about the fact that three very big name journalists got fired by CNN because they were wrong about a big story. Uh, and he was crowing about that, inadvertently 
making the point that he doesn't understand the difference between real news and fake news. Fake news doesn't fire journalists who get a lot of attention saying things that are false. It promotes them. Um, CNN is actually a member of the reality-based community and felt obliged to do something about this, something very serious about it. So I look at indicators like that. I don't expect us all to agree on what's real or fake. You know, I'm not going to stand here and say, you know, the New York Times or whatever, you know, the Weekly Standard is the shining light. Um, I wish it were that simple. Um, let's go over here and then we'll come back. Hi, um, my name is Martin. I'm a journalism undergrad. Super. And I was uh, wondering if you thought there was a risk for liberal science to in itself become like a political centrist kind of like a vanguard of the center. Because I remember you saying um, that it has no priesthood and that it has no political leanings, right? But itself, like it's liberal science, right? And um, you described universities as like the vanguard of, of liberal science, right? They protect it. So I was just wondering if uh, liberal science itself could, you know, stop the progress of political no, movements, right? An interesting question. So I use liberal in the sense of classical liberal, which yeah. a liberal, uh, there's an American sense which means progressive, which means kind of left wing. That there's a very different sense which means it's a rules-based, decentralized social decision-making process like voting or markets um, or peer review, anonymous peer review in multiple different journals. Yeah. Um, it's possible but very difficult for a single political faction to take over a liberal system because it's, it's a network, it's very distributed. And the key to all these systems is that they're, they're pluralistic. Um, a great advantage, a remarkable thing about liberal science is it not only tolerates bias and prejudice and even bigotry, it thrives on them. Because the more opinions go into the process, the more they challenge each other. It needs diversity of belief so that biases can be pitted against, everyone's biased, right? There's no objective individual. Objectivity comes out of the liberal science system in which everyone's biases are pitted against everyone else's bias. And at the end of the day, what withstands the toughest testing the most is the stuff that we call knowledge. That system is inherently very, very difficult to take over. And if it's done right, um, it stays that way. And one of the reasons your question is rather profound is the concern that conformity of opinion is depriving science of the raw materials of diversity belief that it needs in universities. I'm not au courant on the status of university science, but people who are, who I've talked to, say there are actually studies showing a diminution in the quality of academic work in certain specialties that have been studied because there's not enough diversity in the peer review process to make sure that the hard questions always get asked. Um, that's an alarming fact, if that's true. Uh, we had some over here, the gentleman in the red, and then we'll go to the gentleman with the glasses next. My background is, <clears throat> for 35 years, I was an editor and reporter at a newspaper. Which paper? The Review Journal here in Las Vegas. Um, and I'm a visiting member of the journalism faculty Great. here at UNLV right now. And I'm depressed. <laughs> The reason, and I'm not depressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, I'm an optimist. I'm not applauding his depression. I'm applauding <laughs> the reason for his depression. What's the reason? I am depressed part? because I don't really see much hope in the solutions. I see the reality I mean, that these solutions would work, especially what you say about universities. Well, I'm a liberal, but I see the need for uh, more diversity on the faculties of every university, probably. Do you have hope that uh, for the survival of reality? Ma'am, uh, the whole reason I'm here giving this particular talk and spent six weeks thinking about it and working on it and hope to turn it into, build it into something more like a book making these arguments is that I have hope, yeah. Um, so ever since... I have a follow-up on that, but go ahead. Well, I could just say, yes, I have hope and, and leave it at that, but just a word about why I have hope. Um, the challenges to liberal science that we see today are 
great, but pale in comparison to many of the ones it's faced in the past. Think about the totalitarian challenge. Um, when you Perhaps religious challenges. Religious challenges in the, up until the late 19th century. I mean, Galileo was thrown in jail, right? Think about the Inquisition. Think about the fact that in the United States of America, in my grandfather's lifetime, the greatest novel of the 20th century was banned and burned by the United States government. Uh, think about the fact that in, it was as recently as 1958 when the Supreme Court ruled that the US government could not ban a magazine because it was um, targeted to gay people. Um, and then think about the waves of earlier disinformation. So, so here's the thing for people like me, okay? The arguments for liberal science, liberal science is the first, the most successful social institution in the history of the known galaxy. And second, the most counterintuitive institution in the history of the, the whole galaxy, because it says, first of all, you have to allow even the most outrageous things to be said. That's all part of the system. And then second of all, it says, you should believe all of this weird sounding stuff that science comes up with based on trust. Even if in your life, you know, it's like, you're, I don't know, you believe in astrology. That is a huge ask of people. So the result of that is that people like me and you and some of the people in this room will have to get up every morning for the rest of our lives and start from scratch with a new generation explaining freedom of speech and liberal science and the importance of scientific establishment and inquiry again and again and again. We just have to be cheerful about it. But the reason I have hope is that over a long period of time, we've seen the strengthening of these institutions. That said, I'm depressed too, because now is not a good moment and we're facing something really different. So um, follow up, I'll, if you'll make a brief, I'll make a brief, because this gentleman here I wanted to get in. Today's students get their news, their information and news from social media, not, te not television and certainly not newspapers. And yet it's that information that can form a, an education to make political choices. So is there hope in that regard for our republic? Well, I ask people in the, in the room, mm -hmm. I mean, how many of you would say you rely more on social media than a traditional media outlet for news and information? Raise your hand if that would be true. About, it looks like about 10 people. Raise your hand if the opposite is true and you rely more on a traditional information source. So that would be look like about a, a two to one factor, which is actually pretty much what the national polls show. Um, my feeling is that it's not so much the platform per se, it's what are people sharing and how skeptical are they being. Someone like really smart sent me an article that uh, was published in the New Yorker, a great magazine that was like this crazy awful thing Trump was doing. Can you believe this is really happening? She sent it over social media, but it was the New Yorker. Well, she forgot to read the tagline above the article, which said, satire. <laughs> um, so a lot of the problem isn't, I don't think it's the platform. I think it's that people are not being careful. Um, and I'm hoping, back to that word hope, I am hoping that people are starting, more people are starting to look around and say, hey guys, we need to be careful out there. We do need to think about, is this tweet I'm getting from a real human being or is this a Russian bot? There's, there's, is it enough? I don't know. But how many of you, when you read social media, ask yourself, like, is this really true before you would retweet it? How many of you have retweeted stuff like more than once or twice in your life without thinking about veracity at all? No one, one or two? A few times in your life or often a few times? Why did you, why, why did you not do that more often? Um. Because I didn't want to put something out there that I wasn't sure was true. You know, I wanted did, to. Did you experience regret after you tweeted something on the spur of the moment? Um, yeah. Not necessarily, I don't do Twitter, but like. Or, or social yeah. media. Yeah. It was just like, well, why, did, why did I put something that I wasn't, I yeah. didn't look back and verify <clears throat> that it was true? So I think, I think gradually maybe more people are getting to that. And I think most of you are going to be pretty careful. And I'll bet you're going to be more careful in 2017 than you would have been in 2015. Is that a fair statement? 
Raise your hand if you agree with that statement. Raise your hand if, no, if your attitude towards social media has not changed at all in the last two years. A couple hands went up, that's interesting. I have to say my eyes have been open. I could not have given this talk two years ago. I had no clue what was going on. A bot? I didn't know what a bot is. Um, I didn't know you could buy literally hundreds of fake identities for like a couple dollars. Um, yes, sir. Um, the Actually, the angel of time is approaching, so <laughs> let's, make this, let's make this the last. Yeah, I'm really glad you answered his question, because I think your answer, Are you at a student? Least I'm a graduate student here, yeah. In what? Uh, communication studies. Oh, yeah. So um, really dealing with this stuff. So my question was, so the start of your talk presupposes that Trump, uh, Bannon, et cetera, is fake news, is alt facts. Um, do you think there is a method by which, so there are people who disagree with that, obviously, who think yes. that that is not fake news, that is true. Do you think there is a method by which we can use liberal science or anything really to convince those people to think otherwise? Um, it's a powerful question to which I don't know the answer. Liberal science has never staked its bets on persuading everyone out there to like, Here's the scientific method, here's how it works. It's never, it's a black box to most people and it relies on prestige to a large extent. People say, oh, it's science, it must be true. And that's actually an important thing because most people don't have the time, the energy, um, or the interest to understand what goes on in the black box and to get into a debate like, is global warming real or a hoax? Is the hockey stuck, stick manufactured or not? What about all these, the so-called email scandal? It's complicated stuff. A lot of this rests on trust. And a lot of the dilemma for people like you in the academy and me in journalism and at Brookings is to figure out how to rebuild some of that trust. Um, and that's the next job. And I wish I had the answer, but I know. I know that the people in this room, especially the ones who are doing journalism and communications and who will be in academia, are the generation who are going to grapple with that problem. Thank you all, it's been a real privilege. Thank you, sir, for tackling that topic. I apologize for having to stop us. If you have an unanswered question, we can be around for a while, but I, I do want to allow you to get out of here close to time. Uh, Thanks for coming. We'll be back with our next lecture on October 4th. Don't forget to buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be turning our eyes to foreign policy. We'll have a colleague out who's an expert on Asia. So please come and join us if you can. This question is more for you than you. My name's Steve Bessie. I'm a librarian.